we've been looking at the subject of failure. In our very first installment, we looked at the failure and what it is, what it is and what it's not. At the beginning of the year, at the very first installment also, we looked at how people react to failure. And we asked the question, why do people react the way they do? Okay? And we also looked at the fact that what are the potential benefits for reacting to failure in the right way? At the end of our very first installment, we said that the difference between winners and losers, the difference between winners and losers in life is simply the way they view and they respond to failure. We said the difference between the person who wins in life and the person who fails in life is a function of how they respond to what they perceive to be failure. In our second installment, we talked about why men fail. We asked the question, say, why do men fail? Why do people generally, you know, we said that people generally attribute failures to a number of reasons. And we said that the reason, one of the chief reasons uh, that people attribute to failure is number one. They, they call it the social problem. They say because of the social environment where they find themselves, that's why they have not been able to succeed. People attribute failure to economic disadvantage. They say because I live on the other side of the rail, that is why I am not prospering. People attribute failure to an environmental problem. They say it's because of the environment where I grew up in, that is why I am failing. So people attribute failure to political instability. They say it's because of the government of my country or it's because of the government of where I grew up. That is why I am failing. Some even, even attribute failure even to historical issue. They say because of colonialism, because of tribalism, because of genocide, because of racism, because of apartheid. For one reason or the other, they say because of historical reasons, that is why they have failed. Now, while some of these reasons might be true, and we believe that some of them are very valid reasons why people fail. We also noted during our second installment of this particular series that there are some reasons uh, that, you know, the reasons why some people fail goes beyond the physical factors that we talked about. It goes beyond the physical factors. It goes beyond the social. It goes beyond the economic. It goes beyond the physical. It goes beyond, be beyond the, the political situation that is going on in the country. We said that some people fail because uh, there are reasons that are far deeper than what you can see. That some people fail because of some of the things that are deeply embedded in their lives. And we gave an example to be able to support our assertion. We said that there was a man called the King of Saul, who was the very first king of the nation of Israel. We argued that while there were several factors that led to his failure, one of the, one of the reasons why, fall, why Saul failed was because of the insecurity that lies inside the man called Saul. We argue that Saul was insecure. That Saul's insecurity was what led to his jealousy. Saul's insecurity was what led to him not being able to trust a man or trust God. It was Saul's insecurity that made him to be able to desire to please men rather than please God. It was Saul's insecurity that made him to pursue David relentlessly. It was Saul's insecurity that made him to even want to kill his own Saul. In other words, Saul failed. Not because of political reasons. Not because of economic reasons. Not because social inequalities, not because of historical issues, but because of the insecurity that was inside the man or the king, Saul. That was why he failed. And today we are taking a step further. And we are looking at another deeply rooted reason why people fail. Now please understand, I am not saying that political reasons don't make people fail. I am not saying economic inequalities does not make people fail. I am not saying that social injustice does not make people fail. I am not saying that historical factors does not make people fail. What I am saying is that there is another reason that is deeply embedded in the life of an individual that makes that person fail. You know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in addition to all the other issues that is going on around them. So today, we are taking a step further. And we are looking at another deeply rooted reason why men fail. If you have your Bibles with you, if you turn to the book of Judges. Book of Judges, we are reading Judges chapter, 16, uh, Judges chapter 6. In Judges chapter 6, the Bible tells us the story. Tells us the story of the oppression of the children of Israel by the Midianites. The Bible tells us that because Israel sinned, and the, the Israel sinned, the sin, Israel sin resulted in the oppression under the hands of the Midianites. That is the sin of Israel. Because they sinned against the Almighty God, it resulted in an oppression by the Midianites. Number two, because of the oppression of Israel, you found that that poverty resulted. Because of that particular poverty, you find that Israel started hiding because they were oppressed by the media now. and then finally find out that the oppression of Israel the Bible said lasted for seven years and finally they came to their senses after seven years of suffering 
They called out to the name of the Almighty God. By the time you get to verse number 8, the Bible tells us there that Israel now had enough common sense to call upon the Lord God Almighty and the Lord Almighty now gave them a prophet. But apart from giving them a prophet that reminded them that they have failed and that this is where they are falling, the Almighty God also gave them a very unusual character. He gave them an individual who was an unusual deliverer. And if we pick up the story from verse number 11, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord came and sat under the timber tree, which was an offer which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Interestingly, the mighty man of valor was threshing wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianite. Verse number 13, Gideon said, God, you must be mistaken. Oh, my Lord, that tells you Gideon was somebody from the south. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord was with you, is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Say, did not the Lord bring us up from, bring us, us, bring us up from Egypt? Now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianite. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this, in this this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites have I not sent you dear Gideon turned to the almighty God and said you probably are mistaken oh my lord I told you it was from the south oh my lord how can I save Israel indeed my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in the ha in my father's house and the Lord said to him surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianite as one man apart from the fact that uh, Gideon was from the south this verse tells us that there was you know Gideon was the idea of a deliverer that God provided unto Egypt uh, provided unto Israel and you will find that Gideon was the man that God has chosen to deliver Israel at that particular point in time now there was nothing wrong with Gideon physically as a person Apart from, I'm sure he has probably a southern accent. But the only problem was that Gideon was in the same boat. Okay? Gideon was in the same boat with the people he was called to deliver. The Bible said that Gideon was stressing wheat in a wine press. In other words, he was doing the very, very, the most unusual thing. How can you be dressing wheat in the wine press? But that's a story for another day. So the person that God chose, number one, was in the same boat as the rest of the people he was supposed to deliver. Number two, he was not even better than them. The Bible said that he was stressing the wheat, not because he wanted to experiment with dressing wheat in the wine press. He was doing it because, number one, he was trying to hide it from the Midianite. So he was not even better than the people he was supposed to deliver. They were all in the same boat. Number three, Gideon, the problem with Gideon was that Gideon could not see what God saw in him for choosing him. The Lord called him and said, you man of value. And Gideon was looking around. Who are you talking to? You know? Because he did not see what the Lord God Almighty saw in him. Number four, Gideon, could, Gideon had this poor self-image of himself. When the Lord told him that he was a mighty man of valor, Gideon did not see, Gideon saw himself as a nobody. He said, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house, which means I am a nobody. How can you call a nobody to come and do this work? You know, I mean, you're, you're probably mistaken. You're probably looking at the wrong person. And then finally, Gideon did not even know who he was. When the Lord God Almighty called him to be a deliverer. How can you deliver when you don't even know who you are? When you're not even sure of what, who you are? When you have not even seen what God sees in you? How many of us feel like that every day? When somebody comes to you and tells you, hey, you are the most beautiful thing that happened after sliced bread. You say, come on. You're probably eating the wrong size bread. You know, the idea is that many of us think, you know, we, we don't see the value that other people see in us. We don't see the germ that the Almighty God has put in us. And because Gideon did not know who he was, it was a very difficult exercise for the Lord Almighty to convince him that he was going to be what? The deliverer of the people of God. And because Gideon did not know who he was, because Gideon had this poor self-image of himself, the Bible said that he was stressing wheat in a wild press. In other words, Gideon could not see what God, has, what God saw in him. And because he could not see that, he was living a life of fear and a life of failure. Because he could not see the things that God has already deposited in him. 
The valor that God has given unto him. The qualities that God has deposited in his life. Gideon could not see it. And because Gideon could not see it. He was now hiding from the people he could have easily defeated. He was living a life of fear and failure. Because he could not see the image that God has given unto him. The call of God upon his life. He was living a life of limitation and a life of oppression. Because he wasn't moving further. He wasn't advancing his life. He was stand, He was stuck in the same place. He was living a life of oppression. He was threshing wheat in a wine press. Not only that, he was hiding and living an unfulfilled life. Because there was more that God has designed for, uh, for Gideon. There was more that God has played in his life. There were so many things that God has made to... Made for Gideon. By the time you read the entire chapter continuously, you see there are so many things that God has deposited in the life of Gideon that Gideon was about to waste because he did not know who he was. Not only that, his talent and his potential were, uh, were rotting away while he was busy threshing wheat in the wine press. And not only that, he was willing to settle for a life of oppression until the Lord God Almighty stepped in. He has already settled for it. He has taken it as a normal thing that this is my life. I will continue to hide away from the Midianites. I will continue to trash my. I will continue to. I will continue to. You know, to 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 to, to, to produce wheat in a wine press. I will continue to do the things that God has not called for me. He has already settled for less than what the Lord God Almighty has in plan for him. In other words, until the Lord stepped into the life of Gideon, until the Lord God Almighty visited Gideon. Gideon was, you know, character. Gideon's life was characterized by fear. It was characterized by failure. It was characterized by limitation. It was characterized by not being, you know, settling for that which is less than what the Lord Almighty had in store for him. And all of this because of one problem. And that problem was what is referred to as the problem of identity crisis. Gideon had no idea who he was. Gideon did not know who he was. And because he did not know what he, who he was, he did not know what he has been given, he did not know the things that the Lord Almighty has deposited in him, he was willing to settle for anything. He was willing to accept anything. He was willing to live a life that was way, way below what the Lord Almighty had planned for him. Until the Lord visited Gideon and opened his eyes to see his true self, Gideon was living an aimless life. His life was aimless because there was no goal. There was no plan to become better. He had already believed that this was the way his life was going to be. His life was aimless. Until the Lord visited him, he was living in obscurity. Nobody knew who Gideon was. He himself didn't even know who he was. He believed that he was the least in the family. He was the least in the, in the tribe of Manasseh. He was the least in his family. So he was nothing. He was living a life of obscurity. He was living a failed life. Because he wasn't doing what God has purposed for him to do. All because this man did not know what was going on. And this goes to show us that beyond the physical, beyond the economic limitation, beyond the social injustice, beyond the economic inequality, beyond the political instability, beyond the historical injustice that we have suffered, men fail in life when they have no idea of who they are in Christ. Men are not able to move forward in life on, until they find out who they are. Men fail. Yes, there are reasons. Economic disadvantage is there. Yes, there is social injustice. Yes, there is racism. There is all these things. But men fail because they have no idea of the potentials of the things that God has deposited in their lives. Because if they do know you will see that it unlocks a lot of blessing. It unlocks a treasure. It unlocks a fire in their bone that causes them to begin to prosper. Men fail in life when they have no idea who they are. Men fail in life when they go through what is called an identity crisis. They don't know who you are. And the question this morning is this thing that I've been referring to that is called identity crisis. What is it? What is this thing that is called identity crisis? Identity crisis is a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person is not sure who they are. They don't know who they are. It's a period of intense internal struggle to define oneself in a coherent and realistic way. This is when you are trying to find out who you are. 
This is where you are trying to say, this is the person that I am. This is the period where you struggle within yourself. Am I the person that the society say I am? Am I the person that my family says I am? Am I the person that my community says I am? It is a period of difficulty. A period where you don't even just know. It is a period that you find a lot of youths go through. A lot of young adults go through. And unfortunately, a lot of adults go through it also. This is the period where they ask a lot of questions. And that question inside of you, you might not ask anybody, but you ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Am I the job that I do? Am I the bills that I pay? Am I the, the, am I the, pay, the friends that I associate with? Am I the relationship that I have with people? Who am I? This is a period when you try to define yourself and explore different kinds of behavior. And that's why people put their hands into all sorts of things. Just trying to find out who they are. And that's why you find that youths get into, your, into some juvenile delinquency. That's when they get into all sorts of actions. That these actions continue to begin to you know, lead their life in a downward spiral. The idea is that they are trying to define who they are. This is the period when they try to find out who they are apart from their parents, apart from their culture, apart from their environment. This is a period when many begin to exhibit the things that will now begin to look at and say what is wrong with this individual. They become very rebellious at home. They begin to challenge authority. They begin to do things that, are, you know, they begin to defy authority. Not because they want to, they just want to find out who am I. Am I just the image of my father or who am I? Now, this particular period in life is a very good period. If you are able to find an understanding adult or an understanding individual that is able to walk you through that process, you are able to find a person who is able to help you to go through that period of self-discovery so that you understand who you are. When you ask those questions, it's an honest question. It's a good question for you to find out who you are. So that you are not just living your life based on what other people are saying. So that you are not just, you are not just trying to fit into the mold that the society is creating for you. It's a good question. But it's also a very dangerous period. Dangerous in the sense that if you are not able to resolve that question, if you are not able to find the person who will lead you to the process of identifying yourself, if you are not able to answer the question of personal identity, it becomes a problem. And the unfortunate thing is that there are many who grow up to be adults. There are many who grow up into their old age not being able to resolve that simple question, who am I? There are many in the church who grow up without really knowing who they are. Many grow up with the image of somebody that they think they are or there's somebody that they hope to be. And they live their life continuously as a life of deception. And that is why if you read the book of Genesis chapter 32, the Bible tells us that after Jacob has run up and down the whole world, he came to the point where he had to go back and face the nemesis that he has created a couple of years back. And by the time you get to chapter 32, the Bible Bible tells us in verse number 26 uh, that Jacob was holding on to the angel of the Almighty God and he said, Let me go. The angel was saying to Jacob, He said, Let me go for the day break it. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Look at verse number 27. The Bible said unto the Bible said, And Jacob said unto him, and so the angel said unto Jacob, He said, What is your name? And Jacob said, My name is Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. The question that I have is this. Why was the angel asking the name of Jacob? Why was he asking for the identity of Jacob? Are you telling me that the angel of the Almighty God that came to visit Jacob did not know Jacob's name? Come on. The Lord that spoke the universe into existence that knows the end from the very beginning. Are you telling me he doesn't know Jacob's name? Of course he knows Jacob's name. Of course he knows who he was told. Him. But the question is why was he asking him the name? He was asking Jacob the name. He was asking Jacob his name because Jacob has previously identified himself as Esau to his father. So he's asking, who are you? If you told your father that you are Esau, who are you? Jacob has previously been known as a supplanter. Somebody who replaces another. 
Jacob has always been, has been known previously to be a cheat, somebody who robs others of the things that belong unto them. And the angel was asking the question because he was basically saying to Jacob, he said, look Jacob, if you are going to have the blessings of the Almighty God, if you are going to deal with the stagnation of your life, if you are going to move forward and possess the land that the Lord Almighty is giving unto you, I want you to understand that it is important for you to know that you, for I, the angel that has been sent to bless you, to know who you are. But beyond that, it is more important that you yourself know who you are if you are going to possess the blessings of God. Because if you don't know, you cannot possess it. The angel was said, the angel asked the question because he wanted Jacob to confront himself. He wanted Jacob to come to that full, to that full encounter, to that full view of who he really was. It is critically important that you confront yourself and tell yourself who you are if you are going to receive the blessings of the Almighty God. It is critically important. And you will notice, if you read that chapter very well, if you read verse number 29 of that same chapter, you will notice that the angel of the Almighty God did not pronounce a blessing upon Jacob until Jacob knew who he was. Until Jacob told him and said, I am Jacob. In other words, until he admitted to who he was, until he admitted to the image that he has been seeing, it is at that particular time that the angel of the Almighty God now released a blessing unto him. That goes to tell us, my brothers and sisters, that before you can get the blessing of the Almighty God for your life, before you can get to where the Lord Almighty is taking you, before you can possess the land that the Lord Almighty is giving unto you, you must come to the place where you know and you are settled with who you are. And until you get to that point, the blessings of the Almighty God will be elusive. The question is, why is your identity very important? Why is it important for you to know who you are? Why is it important for you to identify who the Lord Almighty has created you to be? So that you, you know, why is it important for you to know who you are? Number one, you, it is important because it defines you. Okay, it defines your core value, it defines your belief. Who you are defines you know your identity defines who you are. Number two, it provides an anchor and a reference point. An anchor in the sense that you know who you are. When America is going crazy, I can say, Yes, I know I live in America, but I'm a Nigerian. I have it gives me an anchor, it gives me an identity, it gives me a point of reference. Not only that, it provides it reveals your uniqueness. Because who you are is designed. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. As many as almost 8 billion people, the Lord Almighty gave you a unique fingerprint. That tells you the uniqueness. Your identity reveals your uniqueness. Your identity clarifies your purpose. Because what the Lord Almighty created you for is already enshrined in your personality. And that's why there's no other two people. You are stuck with this guy. You can't get two of me. He's only one. The idea is that it clarifies your purpose because the way you have been designed, your purpose in life has been designed into you. You remember when we were talking about the issue of the purpose of purpose, we said that the, 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 the seed, the tree is already put inside that particular seed. So whatever the Almighty God wants you to do in life, it's already part of your identity. It's already part of what He has given unto you. Why is your identity important? Your identity is important because it enables your pursuits. It helps you to know what you are supposed to be doing. It helps you to know exactly what you are supposed to be doing. It helps you to know exactly what the Almighty God has designed you to accomplish here on earth. Not only that, it controls how you live. It controls how you live. And that is why human beings don't live underwater. And that's why fish don't begin to climb trees. Because the identity tells them, controls how they live. It controls how you live because when you know who you are as a child of God, it means that you are not going to be unequally yoked together with unbeliever. When you know who you are, your identity controls how you live. And not only that, it establishes your heritage. It tells you what you are qualified to have and what you are not qualified to have. And that is why if you come, if you are, if you are, if you are, if you are a natural born person in this country, you can aspire to be the holy, you can aspire to be the president of the country because that is what your that is what your heritage entitles you to. The point you are making is that your identity establishes your heritage. It tells you what you are qualified to have and what you are not qualified to have. Your identity is so important that the enemy tries to confuse you. Because the enemy knows that because your identity is so central, is so crucial to the fulfillment of the purpose of God for your life, he tries to confuse the individuals. And that's why somebody wakes up one morning and they don't even know who they are anymore. Okay? 
There was a conference that was made, I think, a couple of years that when they talk about uh, what does it mean to be human, and they made, they, 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 they brought together all these souls, all these were uh, very, very highly educated people to talk about what it means to be a human being. Isn't that interesting? But that's a story for another day. We'll discuss that someday. But the point is that the enemy knows that your identity is so important. That's why he tries to confuse men. That is why he tries to steal your identity from you. That is why he tries to kill that particular truth, the fruit of your true identity. And that's why he tries to destroy it. Because it is very important for you. When you know who you are, when you know what God has created you to be, when you know the image of God dwells inside of you, it turns everything around. It makes you a different person. It makes you a danger to the kingdom of the enemy. And the Bible makes us to understand that that is why your, that's why your identity is so important that the enemy goes after that particular identity. You look into our society today and you will see how confused people are. You see how confused they are about who they are. When they look at something and they call it something else. That is because the enemy knows that as long as you are confused about who you are, you can never achieve anything. You can never achieve any greatness. If our identity is so important, what happens to a man who doesn't know who he is? What happens to a man who doesn't know who he is? What happens to a woman who doesn't have an idea of who he is? What happens when you have what you, when you know, when you don't know, I don't, you don't know your true identity? The first thing that happens to you is that there is this fear and lack of confidence in the way you operate. When you are moving up about in life and you don't know who you are, or you don't know what you are capable of, or you don't know the image that God has given unto you, you fear that you cannot operate in confidence. You cannot operate in, you know, you cannot operate in, you operate with fear. Because you don't know who you are. You are not sure of what you are able to do. Number two, you begin to, you are, you are lost and you are lonely. When you don't know who you are. Because you find that you cannot connect. You cannot fit into any place. You find out that people are looking at you one way. And you are looking at you one way. And that is why African children when they come to America. And they are trying to settle down. They go through a lot of crisis. The reason is very simple. At home they are raised as Africans. When they get to school they are appearing as American. At the end of the day who am I? They don't know. They don't know. At home their mother is talking to them in African. At school their are, are teachers are looking at them as American. At the end of the day they cannot bridge that gap. And that is why they are lost and they are lonely. You talk to many of them they cannot fit in. And that's why they engage in a lot of socially destructive behavior. Because when you don't know who you are, you are lost and you are lonely. Not only that, when you are not, when you don't know who you are, you have insecurity and low self-worth. Because you don't think that people know, you know, people appreciate you. You see yourself as not being valuable. You see yourself as not being worthy. You see yourself as less than the other people because you don't know who you are. Insecurity sets in. Not only that, you try as much as possible to begin to blend and try to belong. And that's why you are willing to suck up to anybody just so that they can allow you into the in-group. Because you don't know who you are. You don't know what the Lord God Almighty has deposited in you. That's why you try to blend. You try to belong. You try to be acceptable. You try to make people happy. You try to make sure that every, you know, everybody likes you. You want to be in the in-group because you don't know who you are. And then you live a life of unfulfilled, you live an unfulfilled and unsatisfied life. Because deep inside of you there is a void. There is something that is crying that wants to be filled. There is a hole that even all the people that call themselves your friends, even all those holes, you find that there is nothing to fill it. And that's why you find an African man decide to buy the cream so that he can begin to bleach his skin because he's no longer comfortable in that particular skin. You become unfulfilled, become unsatisfied. And then you waste your potential, you waste your purpose in life. Because you are pursuing something else. You are trying to be what you are not. You are trying to do what you are not supposed to do. You are trying to fit into where you are not supposed to fit in. You are trying to be acceptable by the people who, are not, who you have no business being accepted. You know, you have no business dealing with. You waste your purpose and your potential. And then finally you settle for whatever life gives at you. You settle for whatever life throws at you. And that's why they throw, life throws you crumb. You are rejoicing. Life gives you this kind of nonsense and you say, yes, that's the best thing that ever happened to you. Because you never know what you are qualified for. You do not know what the Lord Almighty has created you for. You do not know the things that God has designed and purposed for you. Now, these are just some of the damages that is done to an individual, to a child, to a young man, a young woman, a young boy, a young girl, an adult that doesn't know who they are. And when you look at our society, you can see the evidence of this. 
A lot of people who are just confused about life, who have no idea who they are, who have no, you know, I mean, they have got it to the point. Can you imagine the University of Tennessee has done a study where you no longer call a woman a woman. You don't call a man a man. You begin to use gender neutral substance, gender neutral adjective, a Z and so, and they look at you. Who is this human being? You find that the head is already upside down. There is this prophet, there's this particular doctor, his name is Ravi Zachariah. He said that they have educated themselves into imbeciles. They have become so stupid in the things that they think that they have studied that, I mean, that's the story for another day. The Lord will help us. The question is, how do you deal with this foolishness? How do you deal with the crisis? Why do you deal with individuals who do not know who they are? How do you deal with this issue of identity crisis? Let's read the book of John chapter 1. Gospel of John. Chapter 1. Let's start reading from verse number 19. The Bible says that now, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, I did not, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. If that's what you're looking for. I am not the Christ. And they asked him, and they asked him What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Verse number 23. John the, John, John, the, John the Baptist now said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the, the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah says. From this verse of the scripture, I want you to understand certain things. The search for a true identity. The search for who you are. The search for the person that God has created you to be. Starts when you know what God has not created you to be. The Bible says that when they came to John the Baptist, they say, who are you? That's the question they asked him. And he told them, I am not the Christ. In other words, I am not that person that you think I am. I am not that particular individual that you think I am. You cannot know yourself unless you know who you are not. Okay? You cannot know yourself unless you know what God has not created you to be. So number one, the search for true identity starts when you know who you are not. Number two, you begin to know yourself when you know what you are not created, when you know that you are not created to satisfy the expectations of order. No, you are not created. You are not, you are not, your, your desire, your purpose in life is not just to please, it's not to live a life of pleasing other people. It doesn't mean that you become obnoxious and become a very annoying person. No. It simply means that you do not fit to, you know, you don't have to uh, fit your life to the expectation of the dictates of other people. They ask him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? If you are not one of the prophets? And the Bible makes us to understand that these people had an expectation of who John should be. They had an idea at the back of their mind of who they expect John to be. And John was trying to tell you, yes, I preach. Yes, I baptize. But I'm not going to fit into that expectation. I'm not going to assume the identity that does not belong to me. I am not the Christ. I'm not living my life to please you. I'm living my life to please the one who called me. So number one is for you to know. Number one is for you to know who you are not. Number two is for you to live a life that is not dedicated to pleasing others. Number three, you begin to know yourself when you know your purpose in life. What has God created you to do? Because that is ingrained in your system. The Bible tells us when they ask them, who are you? He said, I am the voice of the one crying. In the wilderness. He knew exactly his purpose. He knew exactly who he was. John knew that he was born. He knew what he was born to do. He knew what he was called. Why he was called into ministry. And that purpose restrained him. From taking up the identity of the person that he does not belong to. Number four. What you know. How you, you begin to know yourself. When you know your limitations. John the Baptist told the people. He said, I baptize with water. But there stands among you one whom shoe, whose shoe I am not worthy to lose. He said he's preferred before me. He said he will baptize with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist knew his limitations. He knew what he was supposed to do and what he was not supposed to do. And John knew his limitations. He knew that he was not the Savior. As such, he never gave a horse for a false hope to the people. But he directed them to the Savior that, you know, was supposed to come after him. The question is how then? How can we know who we are? Number one, you know who you are when you know the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells in the book of Colossians chapter 2. 
He said, for in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. And you are complete in him, which is the head, you know, and you are complete in him if you read verse number 10. So if you want to know who you are, you first of all need to know the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you want to know if this particular thing can speak hmm, and ask a question and say, who am I? Who will be the best qualified person to answer the question? The person that made it. And tell you, okay, you are made to be a clicker. And that is what you are. Okay? If you as an individual want to know who you are, you go back to the original manufacturer. You know the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. You identify with Christ because it is in identifying with him that you get to know who you are. Number three, you begin to untangle yourself if you want to know who you are. Begin to untangle yourself from the things that are pulling you down, from the ideas that are locking you down, from the association that is not allowing you to move forward. The Bible tells in the book of 2 Corinthians, it says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean things and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and your daughters says the almighty God you have to untangle yourself for you to discover who you are number four you have to spend time in his presence Bible makes us to understand that Jacob finally knew who he was Jacob finally understood that there was an Israel inside of him when he spent time wrestling with the almighty God then you have to receive the self revelation that the almighty gives to you You might have a picture of yourself. But until the Lord God Almighty opens your eyes to see who you truly are, you have no clue who you are. And that was what happened to the man called Isaiah. Bible makes us to understand that Isaiah was a prophet in the, in the palace. He was doing excellent way. He was giving excellent prophecy. The Bible says that he was the one that was calling people to repentance in Isaiah 1. But by the time the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 6, after the death of Uzziah, the Lord God Almighty opened the heaven and gave Isaiah a revelation of himself. And by the time you get to verse number 5 of that same chapter, he says, Woe is unto me, for I'm undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among the midst of people of unclean lips. And Lord Almighty gave him a revelation of who you are, of who he was. And if you are going to know who you are, you must receive a revelation of who you are. You must ask the Almighty God, who am I? Because it is when you are asking him, that's when he gives you a picture. That's when he gives you an idea of what you are. And then when you receive, you know, and then you accept God's blueprints. It is one thing for you to give you a picture of who you are. It's not as I say, Lord, I don't like this particular picture. I think I like the other one. I mean, you can argue with him. <laughs> That's what happened to Jonah. The Bible says that the Lord told him, this is where you're going. This is what I want you to do. And Jonah said, nah, I like you, Lord, but I don't think I like this one. I think I should have a say. This is supposed to be a democracy. I should be able to choose where I want to go. You know? So, the Lord God Almighty gives you a blueprint. This is how you look like. This is who you are. You must be able to accept it if you really want to understand who you are. And then you must walk in the newness of that life. Look at Romans chapter 4. Uh, Romans chapter 6. In verse number 4, the Bible says, Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism unto death. Just and that." And that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also walk in the newness of life. When the Lord Almighty reveals who you are to you, the Lord is expecting you to walk in that newness. Walk in that revelation. Begin to do the things that God says you are. He says you are his child. Begin to act like one. He says you are an overcomer. Begin to act like one. He says you are victorious. Begin to act like that. He says that you are a conqueror. Begin to act like that. Begin to live in the newness of life that has been revealed unto you. It is when you accept the view of who God says you are. And you begin to walk in that newness. That is when your true self begins to emerge. And when your true self begins to emerge, what you will find is that there will be, you begin to find joy in living. Because you are living your life. You are doing the things that God wants you to do. That's when you begin to have a purposeful living. Because you know your life is going in the direction that God wants you to go. That's when you begin to enjoy, enjoy freedom of being you. You are not trying to camouflage. You are not trying to fit into anybody's mold. You are trying to be you that the Lord Almighty has created. That's when you begin to enjoy the satisfaction of a fulfilled life. That's when you begin to enjoy pleasing the Almighty God because you are walking with Him without any guile. There is no pretense. You are not trying to be somebody else. When you see people, you know, I don't know whether you watch stand-up comedians. There are some stand-up comedians that comedy is written inside of them. Just standing up alone is funny. Okay? Then there are some people who try too hard to be funny. And those people who try too hard to be funny, you can tell. Because you know that this guy is not funny. He was not born funny. The same thing. When you, are no, when you know who God has made you to be, you don't try very hard to be you. You are just you. Okay? 
You don't try very hard to be to, to, to present a to present a persona. You are just you. You are just what you are. That is what God created you to be. You live your life. You begin to please the Lord God Almighty because that's who you are. But when you try so hard, something is wrong somewhere. Now, many of us pray to succeed this year. Many of us are looking forward to succeeding. Many of us have been asking the Almighty God to succeed. If you look at the prayer point here, if we were to open the prayer point, you will see most of the prayer point here is for us not to fail in life. It's for us to move from where we are to where we need to be. But one way to avoid failure in this new year is to know who you are in Christ. Know who the Lord God Almighty has called you to be. Know what he has deposited unto you. Know what he has given unto you. The Bible says, I know the thought that I think towards you. They are the thought of good and not of evil. To give you an unexpected hand. You have to know those things if you are going to succeed. But the question this morning is, do you really know who you are? That's the question. Do you know who you are? Or are you like Gideon? Who is still threshing wheat in a wine press? Because he did not know who he is. Okay? That is the question that we have today. Do you know who you are? Do you know what God has called you to be? Do you know his plans for you? Do you know where he's taking you? These are the questions that nobody can answer for you except you 